Well, thank you, guys. You actually had a long day, an interesting day, but I believe also an exhausting day. And you were totally looking forward for an entertainer like Friedrich Lichtenstein now to give you a light time. Instead, you get a politician. <laughs> really bad luck for you, uh, but uh, that happens because of AWS, Austria Wirtschaftsservice, is sponsoring this part, and Austria Wirtschaftsservice is serious business. That is the arm of your Austrian government trying to help you to get funding for your creative ideas. And of course, they want to have got somebody who is serious, and that is me. <laughs> serious in a way that until recent, I was responsible for the entire culture activities of Berlin. I was working for the mayor of Berlin to organize the city culturally. But to keep you calm, beforehand I had got a normal life being the CEO of Universal Music Germany, and later on I had got my own startup, Motor Music. So I know what you're doing, I know how you're feeling right now. I want to talk to, to you the next half hour about two things, like how do people like you, how does creative industry, how do startups change entire cities, like you change Berlin? And how do you change society? So, yep, it's not entertainment time, now it's time to learn. First lecture is you need cities. What cities become creative hubs for people like you? Where do you normally go to? It's only two kind of cities we found out that really attracts people like you. On one hand side, it's cities that are used to change and that are kind of opportunistic because they are into trade. Cities like London, Amsterdam, Hamburg. But most likely, it's cities that have got really a structural problem, like us. Berlin is great in being fucked up and is great in destroying itself or at least give other people a reason to destroy itself. Uh, other cities also have got big structural problems like, for example, Belgrade or Manchester used to have got, but they actually see pretty much the same phenomena. So Berlin, of course, not only was kind of pretty screwed after the Second World War, it also was pretty screwed after reunification. What did happen? Before reunification, Berlin had got high subvention on industry on both sides, on the western side and on the eastern side. So as soon as the two parts came together, subvention went and the entire industry went. So Berlin was the first post-industrial city in the world without no industry. That actually is great for guys like you because you actually become the new major players. And there was a lot of space in Berlin. Not only the industry that fall down and you suddenly had got all the factories, all the plants where you could settle down new business, it was also extremely inner city because the wall dividing Berlin was in the inner city the place where you normally want to be with your company, where you normally want to live, but beforehand, who wants to live next to the wall? Nobody was there. The boom of creative started like the boom of creative starts every time. In former times, so if you were really good in history in school, you know what kings did to attract intellectuals and attract talent to their spaces. They did something you find in Vienna, for, uh, for example, quite often. They subventioned opera, theater, museums. Basically, they invested into entertainment. Uh, in Berlin, it happened in other places. It happens in places that have structural problems without politics investing. So this is a trezor, uh, a place in the inner city that time that started the techno movement. This is the VMF, uh, another great uh, club. This is the EWAG. EWAG, uh, I show you because it's, it already gives you an in indication. A young guy who used to club there did buy it. That's why it's looking that clean. And nowadays, he's heading SAP, 
in Berlin. So uh, that's how Talon starts. That is Planet, the place where I used to hang out until early morning. Um, and that is, some of you already might know it, Bar 25, um, the first club that triggered the entire EasyJet tourism to Berlin because it was the first club where you simply could stay overnight. So you even didn't have to book a hotel. You simply went to Berlin and partied two nights and then back. And most of you, I believe, have queued here already. Uh, that's the Berghain. And I believe the Berghain is nowadays for Berlin at least as important as its three operas and its 150 theaters. Because it's a symbol of a city. It's music that attracts people like you. And it's a pretty normal process in former time. It was good old classic music, it was good theater play. In this time it is electronic music, things that people with an open mind, people who are young, are looking for. And if you have got these people in town, if you have got a lot of space suddenly in your town where people can do creative things, other people follow. First the musicians came, first the DJs came, first techno developed, and then in Berlin the artist followed, all the painters, the sculptures. And that is, might sound nice to you and not a big argument to be in the city, but it gets serious. If you have got all the young hip upcoming artists, also the established, one, the established ones follow. This guy is called Olafur Eliasson, maybe the best known light artist in the world from Iceland. Uh, he nowadays lives in Berlin and has got German citizenship. Um, and when you visit him in his factory on Pfefferberg, you will see that he has got 124 people working for him. This is already a big company. You might also know this guy called Ai Weiwei. Uh, the China only can, could prevent him from moving to Berlin by taking away his passport. As soon as he had got back his passport, he settled down in Berlin. Uh, in his factory, we have got more than 201 people working. In an essence, this is, becomes real business. Creativity becomes a thing that more and more becomes the trademark of a city and has got a great effect. This is the, Berlin, uh, this is the Biennale in Venice. Last Biennale in Venice, 51% of all the artists shown lived and worked in Berlin. So creativity became the core of Berlin thanks to creatives like you. And of course, this attracts real business. I myself moved this company, Universal, in 2002 from Hamburg to Berlin because big creative companies want to be where the talent is. And you guys are the talent. And even boring film studios like Studio Babelsberg uh, can become really, really big if the surrounding is right. Studio Babelsberg nowadays is the biggest European uh, movie studio. The good news for you guys is all this happens without people like me, without politicians. There was no politi politics involved. It simply happened. Uh, it, the only change was in 2002, when the first time Berlin became a, had a mayor called Klaus Wowereit, um, who had got two famous saying. One was, I'm gay and I'm proud of it. He was the first mayor of a major city to say so. And the other thing was, actually that's his husband who's left, Jörn. Um, and the other thing he was saying is, Berlin is poor and sexy. So he recognized that there is a dramatic change going on in the city. And he was the first mayor really to understand that maybe we have to start to talk to people like you and to understand more what's going on here. Simultaneously, this guy showed up. This book was published in 2002. Richard Florida talking about the creative class, about the change of society due to creativity. He was actually researching uh, he, in his university in Toronto, um, how do cities grow? What makes cities prosper nowadays? And he found out about the two, uh, sorry, the three T's. It's tolerance, it's talent, it's technique, what cities are about nowadays. 
He even invented something called the gay index. So the more gay he found in a city, the more likely it is for him that the city has got a good aspect in growing because gay, a lot of gay people means uh, there is a lot of tolerance in the city and that has got a, uh, a consequence that a lot of people come who look for tolerance, who want to live free, who want to live uh, to actually uh, do the ideas. In Berlin, we actually say it's pretty much about space. You need space. Well, we'll come back to that one. It's about culture and it's about science, which is pretty close to what uh, this guy told. So what was the consequence for Berlin out of all this? I give you some numbers before I jump into uh, how you even change society. You change the city big way. 120,000 people every year are moving to Berlin. 68% of them are coming from foreign countries, not from Germany. 72% of them have got uh, a university degree. That is much, much more than uh, normally leverage is in Berlin. So it's an entire dramatic change of the city. In consequence, since reunification, 58% of the inhabitants of Berlin is new. So you're actually talking about a changing city. And the biggest industry in this city without industry is you, is creative industry. It's 16.1% uh, of the entire value produced in Berlin is pr uh, produced by creators. Just to show you some unicorns that you know, of course, from Berlin, like Native Instruments, Soundlight, Zalando, there are already some more of them. And you might not know, I'm not uh, a liberal, I'm uh, from the Social Democrats, but I really loved this campaign that the liberals did in uh, London when the Brexit came, uh, because they actually hired this car telling the Brits, keep calm, just go to Berlin, everything will be okay. And that is one of the few times where I totally say the liberals are right. So now you actually have in something like 12 and a half minutes, you got um, how people like you can change an entire city and how people like you can make a city prosper. You really should be self-confident. All this that Berlin now is seen as the greatest city was not really a genius political move. Yeah, we had got a mayor who actually discovered that something is going on, but we didn't engineer too much. Uh, you should be self-confident enough to actually ask politics, ask politicians to support you because you're doing something of great value. You are changing society. First of all, you are changing places. In Berlin we say, first there come the clubs, then there come the artists, Next come startup companies, and then come real investment companies. And the real investment companies will make the clubs go, will make the artists leave, and will make the startup leave. And uh, that is really a problem that we already figure out because uh, your companies you are working in need space, and you need a different space than the Mercedes-Benz and the old industry of yesterday because they easily could, could have been moved out of the city. You have to be in the city because people working for you have got a different idea what works means. So they want to be close to where they work. They want you, their work to be connected with their nightlife, with their social, with their cultural activities. They want to be flexible during daytime. So you need inner city spaces. There are new spaces developed for people like you. This, for example, is the factory in uh, Berlin. But to move into the factory, you already have to have made it. The factory has got companies in there like Twitter or like SoundCloud, and they can pay a decent rent, even though, of course, 
you guys know objects like this. These objects are not normal business buildings. So this is nearly an entertainment building with sports units in there, with a club in there, with restaurants in there, because it's like you live. It's like life and uh, work is something that have to get together. What we need is more and more projects like that. That is called Eckwerk. Uh, to be honest, Eckwerk is the first skyscraper totally built out of wood. Uh, I personally invested in there. Uh, that's why I'm a bit of nervous, because there might be a reason why we have got no skyscraper out of wood yet. Um, maybe it doesn't work. Graft Architects telling us it will work. The idea behind this is not so much to build a skyscraper out of wood. The idea behind this is to make this is a place where a lot of people can start their business. This is central Berlin next to the River Spree and the idea of the people behind this is that they are saying, and it's a corporation, and the, the state of Berlin gave the land nearly for free. It's a corporation building it and the condition is to enable people like you to start their business there for nearly no money uh, paying for the space you need. But after three years, it will become extremely expensive. So the idea behind this is like, uh, within three years' time, you have to make it. Within three years' time, we have to be that good that you want to stay there. And you start to subvention all the other new business coming up. We have to test ideas like this because we need you in a city and you need to be there. We already see this with the artist. The artist uh, did a big campaign in Berlin saying uh, Kunst sieht an und nicht aus. That means art attracts and doesn't move away. So what we, had, we are now doing is, for example, when we have got artists working somewhere and this place where they work in is going to be sold, the state gives them a loan to enable them to buy the space where they are in. If they fa fail to repay the loan, the state has got a place for other artists to come in. So not a big problem for the state. The same could apply for startups, that you say like, okay, the startup is threatened because it's pushed out of where it is right now uh, and make him buy. And if the startup doesn't have got the money, let the state buy, uh, because real to own real estate as a state makes sense these days. It's not dangerous at all. You have got another problem. So one key problem that you have got uh, is banks. The world out there is unfair. On one hand side is unfair because you guys make areas with your companies attractive and then you're pulled out of it. So politics should do something about it. Another problem that you have got, you make your company grow and most of you know in this essential moment when your company grows, the most difficult thing is to get finance. Companies normally don't collapse in a period in the beginning. They normally collapse while they're growing. It's not that difficult if you're smart and a lot of you are smart to get seed capital but it's extremely difficult to get growing capital. And you know why? They, it was politicians forcing the banks to do something like Basel II. Basel II is an agreement of all banks internationally that was uh, set up after the uh, new economy bubble burst in 2001. And it's saying like, you can't give any loans on ideas. But People like you normally are producing ideas and you have to get loan on stuff that you produce. I know the problem, like when I have got copyrights of extremely successful musicians like Rammstein, nobody would give me a loan on Rammstein's compositions, which is totally mad because for sure the money will come in. You have to find other activities. Uh, Berlin. For example, start to do one thing where they in start to invest into companies. So to, to say like, uh, we do a fund that actually just jumps in when you get into the growing period of companies. And uh, these are some companies where we actually have got an investment in. 
Uh, and we also have got this attitude, the whole city is a startup. Uh, in a way, we are. We are not even able to build an airport. So we are, we are starting up every day. Um, and uh, what, what we try is we, we try to educate. So what the city offers is at least when you're growing and your crew has to get better skills, that there are programs at this very moment where you can ask for uh, your crew to be trained by the state. So that's something you should ask for, for a state. Help us in getting money. In, uh, make, intervene with the banks and help us training our crews. What politicians also have to understand is that the world of work totally changed. Your dads, or especially your granddads, had got an idea of work where, first of all, they were working and not their women. And secondly, uh, they had got the idea of them getting one work and keeping this work their entire life. Nowadays, I don't have to tell you, it's often difficult to employ people. Because a lot of people are saying, oh, why should I get employed? I have got all my freedom there. I can work wherever I want. I can work how I want. I can be perfectly self-employed. And that is something that is only too understandable, having in mind that this year is an entire factory, that uh, any computer can do things where you need really a lot of space, really a lot of manpower and former types. So people relaxed are saying, hey, I do it on my own. The problem on doing on your own is a lot of them uh, come into deep trouble as soon as they get ill, as soon as their business doesn't kick off. Um, so you actually also have here politics to think about this. So on one hand side, I don't believe that a society needs a lot of people being employed at companies. It could be for the companies and for you if you're self-employed. It would be better to do it on your own. But you need another form of security. That's why we're in Germany discussing uh, something we call Bürgerversicherung, which is uh, a security on health care uh, and on pensions for everybody who works, whatever they work, freelance or um, uh, employed. That's also why we start to discuss something that our friends in Switzerland started to discuss, which is the unconditional income. Something that might really, really help in a situation like a social transformation with people that more and more don't have got one typical day-to-day -day job, but that depend on creativity. You are more creative when you're safe, when you know that you have got a certain ground you're standing on where you don't fall down. Get involved into discussions like this. It might also help your business if you have got uh, discussions like that going on in your countries. A key important discussion where you, where you also change economy and society is distribution. The great, you are extremely independent, much more independent uh, than a lot of other entrepreneurs because you need less, you are faster. Most of you are, have got one key problem that is distribution and communication channels. Distribution communication channels are still controlled by a few, basically normally American companies and a few telecommunication companies. Uh, they give you a hard time. If you're a game developer and you depend on online gaming, you totally know what I'm talking about when it comes to telecommunication and the fees you suddenly have to pay to them. Uh, when you're into content and uh, it comes to data, you totally know what I'm talking about when it comes to social media and trying to get really the data that you want for the data that you give in, the content you get in. There are examples where politics already reacted on situations like that. This, what you see up there, is called music cassette. Uh, it used to have got the size of an iPhone and uh, it, there was music on it. Um, you could play and erase it. When that one was developed and brought to the market, the entire music industry had got the impression, oops, that's it. Nobody has got a reason to buy a record anymore. And uh, globally, 
globally, politics came up with a levy. There's a levy on any cassette uh, that you're buying. There's also a levy on any uh, copy machine that you're buying. There's still a levy on any drive that's in a computer that you're buying. And this levy, this kind of certain percentage of money is for creative people. It's badly distributed, but there's a lot of money coming together for creative people already on the good old analog systems. Something like this can be applied also to digital distribution companies, to telecommunication companies. There's a lot of money that maybe could create another kind of fairness. Also, when they become so important as kind of bottlenecks, I believe it's the duty of politics and politicians to regulate. Now you see, I'm not a liberal. So, this is my favorite band, Kraftwerk. Actually, the first record I ever bought was Autobahn. Um, but this picture I didn't put up to show you Kraftwerk. This picture I only put up to f uh, for the funny robots that we see in the background, which is the last aspect of dramatic change that is happening here. Nowadays, uh, a lot of you work on two things. One thing is uh, you do things that will make people unemployed if you're successful. Because you create machines that learn from machines and suddenly the machine is much cleverer than any man that operates a machine ever could be. If we talk about automotive driving, what happens to taxi drivers, lorry drivers, bus drivers, goodbye. And the same goes for 3D printers. Why should people work in a factory when everybody is actually printing what they want at home? So there will come dramatic change. Obama had got a session in Parliament in March last year where he presented research of MIT. MIT is saying uh, until 2030, 47% of all classic jobs will be dismissed. We have got pretty much the same thing in Europe. It's here it is Oxford. The Oxford uh, economic papers are saying uh, that within the next 15 years, 53% of all jobs will be gone. The only thing that helps in this case is two things. One, we had it before, debates like unconditional income, if you have got such a dramatic uh, change. The other thing is like total different form of education. It's, I, I'm older than most of you and I have got two kids. Uh, and I know that they're still learning the same shit I learned. Which is totally bizarre, because uh, the world has changed dramatically since then. All the things to know, all the things doesn't matter. You have to know where you get the information, and you have to know how you validate the information. But you don't have to know it by heart. The key things, the key difference, where even if you're extremely smart, that will not that soon happen is that a computer gets, gets as creative, as emotional as a human being can be. So the key capital is creativity. The key cap capital of human beings being more important than machines is emotion. You have to learn kids in totally new lecture. They have to become really creative not only to work in a few years in new companies, who are then kind of unicorns wherever you are, uh, but also to make them happy and to make them valid members of society. To sum it up, I would be a really bad politician not summing up, is what you have to have in mind is you need space and you need inner city space, you need attractive space, demand it. There are ways to keep the space for you. I showed you a few examples. You need capital for growth. Definitely uh, ask for it. Protest in your political discussions that you have got and even go to, first of, first of all, go to political discussions. Involve yourself and point out that you are treated unfair. 
why is somebody who's producing cables, why is somebody producing paper treated better by banks than you are? There's no reason for it. Point out that it's not you being mean bastards by not employing people, it's the people who often don't want to get deployed. And that it's the job of the politics to come up with some social security ideas also for them. And insist on fair distribution, fair distribution of data, fair chances for you and your product. It can't be in the interest of states and politics to have got a few company basically being American origin, having their hands on it. And latest when you become yourself a mother or father, insist on new creative education because that is what we need to meet here again in 25 years. I'm then the Chancellor of Germany and you are happy owner of a really big successful company and we all can celebrate together that we change the world but we have to do this little task list. We have to insist on it. Go for it, be, be successful and go on changing the world.